Welcome to the digital learning on the man in asbestos by Stephen Butler Leacock. This is a video on session two. I am Prasanaud Peeker, Associate Professor, and The Man in Asbestos is a short story prescribed for the general English students of third semester BCom studying under Bengaluru City University. There are totally seven videos on this first lesson, and this is the second video for session two. Let us have a look at the highlights of this session. In this session, you would be learning the narrator's purpose of his journey to the futurist world, the narrator's preparation to his trip to the futurist world, the narrator's visit to the future world after 300 years, the meeting of the narrator and the man in asbestos, and then we will also learn the discussion on the characteristics of the millennium world. Learning objectives of this session. This session aims to sensitize the importance of work and joyfulness in life, to get the student acquainted with the style of the short story, to understand the story and grasp its meaning, to correlate the idea in the story with their life experiences, to enjoy the charm and beauty of life with all its challenges and strife. At the end of this session, the student would be sensitized to the life in millennium, recapturing the era of the great conquest of nature would take place, acquiring human values and the world view. Work and joyfulness in life would be the outcome of this session. Let's have a quick recap of what we had studied in session one. In session one, we dealt with brainstorming questions. We also studied the author's autobiographical details. We studied the theme, characters and the message of this short story. Now, let us start reading the short story. At the very outset, the author tells his purpose of visiting the futurist world. He says, to begin with, let me admit that I did it on purpose. Perhaps it was partly from jealousy. It seemed unfair that other writers should be able at will to drop into a sleep of four or five hundred years and to plunge and head first into a distant future and be a witness of its marvels. So if the other writers are able to travel or take a trip to the future world, a world after three to five hundred years from now, and then have a look, have an experience of the world, the author felt, why shouldn't he also do that? So he says, he too wanted to do that, to know the characteristics of the futurist world. He had always been a passionate student of social problems. The narrator says that the world of today with its roaring machinery, the unceasing toil, the unceasing struggle of its working classes, its strife, its poverty, its war, its cruelty, appalled him as he looked at it. He loved to think of the time that must come someday when man will have conquered nature and the toil-worn human race enter upon an era of peace. He loved to think of it. He longed to see that 
the world would be free of any struggles free of any cruelty free of any toil and there would be only peace so he planned to fall asleep and wake up after 300 years now the narrator makes preparations for a long sleep he did it deliberately what he wanted to do was to fall asleep after the customary fashion for 2 or 300 years at least and wake and find himself in the marvel world of the future so he made the preparations for the sleep he bought all the comic papers that he could find even the illustrated ones he carried them up to his room in his hotel with them he bought up a pork pie and dozens and dozens of donuts he ate the pie and the donuts then sat back in the bed and read the comic papers one after the other finally as he felt the awful lethargy stealing upon him he reached out his hand for the london weekly times and held up the editorial page before his eyes it was in a way clear straight suicide the narrator says he did it he could feel his senses leaving him in the room across the hall there was a man singing his voice that had been loud came fainter and fainter through the transom the narrator fell into a sleep the deep immeasurable sleep in which the very existence of the outer world was hushed dimly he could feel the days go past then the years and then the long passage of the centuries then not as it were gradually but quite suddenly he woke up he sat up and looked about him the narrator wakes up he finds himself lying or rather sitting up on a broad couch he was in a great room dim gloomy and dilapidated in its general appearance and apparently from its glass cases and the stuffed figures that they contained he felt that it was some kind of museum beside him there sat a man his face was hairless but neither old nor young he wore clothes that looked like the gray ashes of paper that had burned and kept its shape he was looking at the narrator quietly but with no particular surprise or interest the narrator asked him where am i who are you what year is this is it the year 3000 or what is it the man in asbestos driven his breath with a look of annoyance on his face then he said what is this way of excited way of speaking he said what a strange way the narrator repeated tell me is this the year 3000 the man in asbestos said i think i know what you mean but really i haven't the faintest idea i should think it must be at least that within a hundred years or so but nobody has kept track of them for so long uh, hence it is very difficult to tell you whether it is 3000 years or so the narrator was surprised he asked don't you keep a track of time at all the man calmly said we used to i myself can remember that a century or two ago there were still a number of people who used to try to keep track of the year but it died out along with so many other faddish things of that kind why showing for the first time a sort of animation in his talk he said what was the use of it you see uh when we found that keeping a track of time was useless we simply eliminated it we stopped keeping track of time that is because we have eliminated death the narrator sat upright he was shocked he said eliminated death
good God. The man found the narrator very strange. He said, We have eliminated not just death, we have also eliminated food, change, and we have practically got rid of events. The narrator felt that his brain was reeling. So he told the man, stop, stop, come on, tell me one at a time. The man said, okay, you must have been asleep for a long time. Go on then, ask me questions. Don't be too much interested or excited. So go on asking questions one by one. I will answer you one question at a time. Yes, the narrator asked the first question. What are those clothes made of? Asbestos, answered the man. They last hundreds of years. We have one suit each and there are billions of them piled up if anybody wants a new one. Okay, now tell me where I am, asked the narrator. You are in a museum. The figures in the cases are specimens like yourself. But here, yeah, the man in asbestos said, if you want really to find out about what is evidently a new epoch to you, get off your platform and come out on Broadway and sit on a bench. We will talk. So the narrator got down as the narrator and the man in asbestos passed through the dim and dust covered buildings. The narrator looked curiously at the figures in the cases. He looked at one figure in blue clothes with a belt and baton and identified it as a policeman. The narrator and the man in asbestos walk out of the museum. The change that the narrator sees was absolutely appalling. In place of the roaring thoroughfare he had known, the narrator sees silent, moss-grown desolation. Great buildings fallen into ruin through the sheer stress of centuries of wind and weather, the sides of them coated over with a growth of fungus and moss. The place was soundless. Not a vehicle moved. There were no wires overhead, no sound of life or movement except here and there. They passed slowly to and fro, human figures dressed in the same asbestos clothes as the narrator's acquaintance was wearing, with the same hairless faces and the same look of infinite age upon them, some of the people were moving around. They looked old, they looked very dull. Now in this session, we have learned how the narrator takes a trip to the futurist world in his dream. When he wakes up, the narrator sees that he is placed in a museum and he sees a man with hairless face in asbestos dress sitting beside him. Now both of them walk out of the museum and sit on a bench on the Broadway. The conversation between the narrator and the man in asbestos continues in the next video also. Thank you students for watching this video.